Jethro Tull were the ultimate outsiders. There was no one like them then, and there's been nobody like them since. One of the most eccentric yet commercially successful prog rock bands of all time. Jethro Tull were progressive rockers with flutes who became huge to everybody's surprise. Ian Anderson was born in 1947 in the Scottish town of Dunfermline, where his father ran a boiler company. He moved to Blackpool, and that is where he met the other members of Jethro Tull. John Evan was born in 1948, and Geoffrey Hammond was born in 1946, both in Blackpool in Lancashire. John Evans would later change his name to the slightly more interesting John Evan, and Geoffrey Hammond would become Geoffrey Hammond Hammond which was in honour of his mother's maiden name. Hammond, Evan and Anderson all met at grammar school in Blackpool and formed a band together, initially influenced a bit by the Beatles, uh, but also with a kind of blues and rock feel. Their early influences would have been Motown, Georgie Fame was a key influence, I think. It was the animals, actually, that inspired them to bring an organ into their musical setup. As the John Evans band, they started to get a little bit of success in the north of England and toured around quite a lot and decided to move to London. At this point, I think there was about seven members and they just wasn't financially viable. So they kind of stripped away some of the members and started again. Jethro Tull's first lineup consisted of Ian Anderson, Mick Abraham, Glenn Cornick and Clive Bunker. At the time, this pub and club scene was extremely competitive. And the way they decided to get more gigs was to go under a variety of names. At one point, they became Ian Henderson, they became Bag and Nails, they became the John Evans Smash. And the reason for this was apparently because they struggled to get repeat bookings. So if they renamed the band, then the manager of the venue didn't know who they were booking. Apparently, Ian Anderson once turned up at one gig and looked at like, thinking, oh, yeah, heard of them, heard of them, got no idea who they were, and it was his own band. The name Jeffro Tull uh, comes from an 18th century agriculturist. They had a booking agent who was a bit of a history buff, and after they'd been saying, we've got all these names, he said, well, what about Jeffro Tull? It's the name that the band were using the night they got a repeat booking, so they stuck with it. Ian Anderson is known for wearing this big, uh, quite dramatic looking overcoat on stage. And the reality is he was wearing it because he was so poor. He was living in this freezing bedsit in London at the time with no money. And he bought the coat to keep him warm. After releasing Sunshine Day in 1968, Ian Anderson decided he didn't want to play guitar in the band anymore. He wanted to be at the front of the stage, and he also wanted to do something a bit more idiosyncratic. So he decided to take up the flute. He had a very basic how to play the flute book, which came with his flute. But really, he learned on the job. Flute wasn't something that bands used. So it gave Jethro Tull a unique sound and became a thing that everyone remembers them by. By 1968, Jethro Tull had played so many shows that they were beginning to get a real cult following. When it came to the National Jazz and Blues Festival at Sunbury, all their hardcore fan base turned up. They got an incredible reaction from the crowd, which I don't think they were expecting or anyone was expecting. Jethro Tull released their first album, This Was, in 1968, reaching number 10 in the charts. Mick Abrahams left because he was a bit of a blues purist. He was feeling a bit pushed out as the front man as Anderson was kind of coming more to the front of the stage during performances. When he left, they uh, approached David O'List, who was in the Nice at the time, and he turned them down. 
they approached future Rolling Stone, Mick Taylor, and he wasn't having any of it either. And then, of all people, Tony Iommi, who would later be in Black Sabbath. He did actually play a few concerts with them. After Tony Iommi, they settled on Martin Barr, who stayed with the band. After Jethro Tull toured with Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, Anderson was asked by the management to, in inverted commas, write a hit. Living in the Past was a number three hit, which if you think is a, you know, a flute-driven song in a 5-4 time signature is unusual. So we're really seeing the beginning of progressive rock. Jethro Tull's 1969 album, Stand Up, soon followed, which quickly reached number one in the UK chart. Stand Up was everything that this was, wasn't. This was Ian Anderson taking control. You're getting the beginnings of what becomes progressive rock. You're getting classical influence, unusual instrumentation, different times, which is things that are hard to play that you're kind of almost showing off, um, and a certain degree of eccentricity. This ended up resulting in their first headline tour and was a massive breakthrough for the group. Jeff Rotel went on their first big US tour and played at the Newport Jazz Festival. And they were getting a lot of very positive attention and were subsequently invited to play at Woodstock. But Ian Anderson decided that that would be a bad move. He turned it down. Jethro Tull turned down Woodstock because they were worried about being typecast as hippies. Maybe they would have been right. Nothing is easy, though time gets you worrying, my friend, it's OK. Returning from the US, they played the Isle of Wight, and it went down really, really well. It was a big hit. So this is establishing them as one of the biggest bands in Britain now. At the same time, they're suffering from a lot of lineup changes. John Evan rejoined after playing as a session musician on the band's second album, Benefit, which did better in the US than their debut. Jeffrey Hammond was also asked to replace Glenn Cornick on bass. Drummer Barry Moore Barlow replaced Clive Bunker in 1971 for the release of double album Aqualung. Aqualung was a huge hit. It went to the top ten in the US. And the, the strange thing is, is that it's actually a very, it's kind of an intellectual album, really. It's not pop. And it's not rock in the normal sense, either. Ian Anderson was worried that it wouldn't get a good reaction. It had a lot of religious themes on it. It was quite controversial and quite out there, really, in terms of an album, but in fact, it was their biggest hit to date. It was really well received and sold very, very well. Aqualung sold over one million copies, earning a gold disc in July 1971. Thick as a Brick was the follow-up to Aqualung, and quite interestingly, Ian Anderson, after reading reviews of Aqualung, which said it was a concept album, was like, well, that wasn't a concept album. I'll show you what a concept album is. Really don't mind if you sit this one out. My words, but a whisper, deafness, a shout. It's about an eight-year-old boy genius called Gerald Bostock. The suggestion was that he had written the album, not Jeff Tull. It contained uh, spoofs of contemporary society. It was printed in a, in a spoof newspaper. When they toured it, there were skits between a lot of the songs, and there was a huge Monty Python influence to it. You make all your animal deals, and your wise men don't know how it feels. To be thick as a brick. Got to number one in the US, in Canada, in Australia, top five in the UK was a real moment in terms of prog rock music as a, a marker for that genre. They'd made so much money at this point because they were so successful in Britain and America that they took a 
Tax XL year out and went to record in France in the Chateau de Eureville. It just didn't work out for them. They called the place they were staying the Chateau Disaster because nothing that they put down they ended up releasing. It was a problem with the sound. Other bands recorded there, the Stones had recorded there, but they said the, the quality was just terrible and they could not make it work. So they returned to England, they scrapped everything and started again. As a brick. After failing to record anything at the Chateau d'Ereville, Ian Anderson quickly wrote and recorded his next single track concept album, A Passion Play. All along me I see waste that a face is smiling in the gloom. It actually sold incredibly well, got to number one in the US again, which was their second album in a row to do so. In the mid 70s, Jeffro Tull commercially were at their height. They were selling so many records, they were getting loads of number ones and doing really well in the charts, but critically, were getting some really dodgy reviews. Jethro Tull hadn't been really championed by the British music press, and when they became successful in America, it was without their permission and they turned on them. They were still selling incredibly well. 1974's War Child album was a commercial success yet again. And Anderson has actually said that the single he wrote, Only Solitaire, was directly aimed at sniffy music critics. The critics falling over to tell themselves he's boring and really not an awful lot of fun. The Minstrel in the Gallery came out in 1975, and this was the beginning of a kind of uh, florid, almost Baroque sound. There's an early music influence. They had a string quartet rather than orchestration. The Minstrel in the Gallery Looked down upon the smiling faces Minstrel in the Gallery was a bit of a return to the kind of aqualung time of Jeff Tull, a move away from the concept album, more of a mix of sounds on the record. It merged quite soft folk with quite loud rock. But what really made it stand out was that it was Ian Anderson's divorce album. And for perhaps the only real time in his career, he was introspective and it was quite a turn. In 1975, uh, Melody Maker labelled Jethro Tull the biggest band in the world. This was after a five-night run at the Los Angeles Forum, which seats 20,000 people, so that's 100,000 tickets sold overall in the space of a week. They'd also had five consecutive American top 10 albums. They were the most surprisingly big band in the world. You don't think that one guy playing flute, hopping on one foot, while Elizabethan madrigals are going on in the background is going to be a recipe for success, but it was. Runs the all-time loser, dead long to his death. Jeff Rotel's live shows became pretty legendary. It was the idea of turning the concert into an ongoing performance. So it wasn't just trotting out the hits. You started doing these kind of big spoken word interludes. A theatrical take on uh, pr presenting a rock concert. They were also, uh, by 1976, one of the first bands to embrace using giant projection screens. <laughs> Jethro Tull invented this thing called tull -O vision and this was big screams featuring the band. And it brought the band next to the people at the back row of an arena. Having fun, always oh, calling down the corridor. mid-70s, Ian Anderson moved to the country, and guess what? So did Jethro Tull. At this time, John Glasscock replaced Hammond Hammond on bass. Have you seen the Jack in the Green? With his long tail hanging down. In the late 70s, Jethro Tull released uh, songs from the wood, Stormwatch and Heavy Horses. Heavy Horses. 
three folk albums, quite different from what they've been releasing in the previous years. And I think this was influenced by Ian Anderson's new lifestyle. He's moved to the countryside, was living on a farm, and I think that was kind of seeping through into what music he was writing. It was all suddenly this rather bucolic, acoustic folk rock take on British life. The old line Jethro Tull's folk period had turned them into folk aristocracy because they were selling more records than any British folk band could even conceive of. Jethro Tull provided the backing vocals on the Steel Ice Band front woman Maddie Pryor's 1978 solo album, Woman in the Wings. And they were friends with quite a lot of people involved in the folk movement. They also had a long standing connection with Fairport Convention. In fact, most of the members of Fairport had been members of Jeffro Tull at some point. So there was a real kind of exchange of ideas and, and musical themes. During 1979, John Glasscock sadly passed away. Barry Barlow was deeply upset and withdrawn and obviously depressed after the death of the man he called his best friend. At the same time, John Evan, who's one of the founder members, wasn't keen on Ian Anderson's plans to make a solo album, so he left. Ian Anderson wanted to make a solo record and in fact started recording one, but due to pressure from the record label, it ended up being released as a Jeffro Tull album. A was released in 1980, and in keeping with the album's theme of innovation, Jeffro Tull developed an ambitious music video titled Slipstream. Slipstream, I think, was an attempt for them to join the MTV generation. Slipstream was directed by David Mallet, who of course had worked with David Bowie on Ashes to Ashes. And what he did was take concert footage of Jeff Rotel and mix it up with four different music video concepts. There's one in which they were stuck inside a giant pinball machine. There's another way they're being chased by vampires, so it's almost like uh, Michael Jackson's bad. They were really going to town with the uh, possibilities of video. In 1982, Peter John Vettes joined on keyboards and the band returned to a somewhat folkier sound, albeit with synthesizers, for the broadsword and the beast. In the half-tone light of a young morning She sighs and shifts on the pillow And across her face dancing the first shadows fly To kiss my pussy willow In 1984, they made Under Wraps which was an electro album, chiefly concerned with surveillance and spying. They didn't even use a, a drummer on it, they had a drum machine on the entire record. The money won't last forever. Red man twice today. I hope someday you'll find me in the lap of luxury. Oh, lap of luxury. After Under Wrap, uh, Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull as a whole took a three-year hiatus. The reason that Ian Anderson took some time off was because he developed some throat issues. He had to take a break and he ended up spending a few years running a salmon farm instead of being in Jethro Tull. But Jethro Tull would return in 1987 with Crest of a Knave. Crest of a Knave was Jethro Tull being fairly rocky. Remarkably, they were nominated for a hard rock Grammy. There was a bit of an uproar to this because Jethro Tull weren't considered a, a rock or heavy metal band. Uh, and in fact, they hadn't even gone to the ceremony because they thought there was no chance they were going to win it. Somehow, ahead of Metallica, Crest of a Knave won a Grammy. There we had it, Jethro Tull, rock Grammy winners. Later on, when asked about the kind of criticism, Ian Anderson said something like, uh, well, we, we have been known to play our mandolins quite hard. The 90s saw a few new releases from the band, including Catfish Rising, Roots to Branches, and jtal.com. 
In 2001, Ian Anderson joined up with some former members of Jethro Tull, people such as Glenn Cornick, to play a series of pub gigs. It's the first time they'd all played together since 1968. And of course, Jeff Rotel having this very loyal uh, fan base went absolutely crazy for it. There's a lot of nostalgia for Jeff Rotel, a lot of affection for them. It was appealing that they'd gone away from being one of the biggest bands in the world and got away from stadiums and were just like a band starting out again almost. After the reunion, Anderson went back to releasing solo material, uh, including Thick as a Brick 2, Whatever Happened to Gerald Bostock, and an album called Homo Erraticus. He has said that's it, there will not be any new recorded Jeff Tull music, he's just going to be as a solo performer now. So I think you can now say, after everything, Jeff Rotel is over, and Ian Anderson was asked about it, and he said, I just think by the time you get to my age, you want to use your own name. I think Jeff Rotel's legacy is to take all these things which are not normally associated with rock and roll, like flutes and those kind of Monty Python-esque eccentricity, and show that they can have a place in it. Runs the all-time loser, and long true his death. They really were the first kind of commercial prog rock band to sell that many records with music that isn't kind of straight down the middle mainstream. They also developed the notion of a concept album and showed that a concept album can be very successful. And that's probably their most lasting legacy.